Well, hello, everybody. Wow, that's loud. It's like the voice of a demigod. Uh, anyways, hi, I'm Michael Cote. This is a session, when is the DevOps unicorn going to sprout wings and fly? And uh, as you can see, perhaps you can't, but I'm from Austin. And uh, you know, we, we've got an interesting little DevOps thing going on there. And, and we've been studying and looking at DevOps for quite some time now. And you know, what, I, what I wanted to do in this talk is go over the question. Um, you know, so if you're not like Netflix or CERN, or all these other people who are sort of like special unicorns in their own right, and you're sort of in the mainstream world, and you're interested in applying DevOps in your normal run-of-the-mill, pay-the-bills job, how's that working out? Like, how, how's mainstream DevOps going? And so that's what I'm gonna go over here. And I think it's especially applicable for the, the OpenStack Summit crowd and, and conference, because my theory, which is more or less anecdotally proven out, is that many, many of the reasons that you build a cloud is to run custom written applications on top of it, which as we'll get into sort of begs the question of doing more DevOps, if you will. So it's sort of one of the practices one might be deploying up in the stratosphere of the clouds you guys are building to mix metaphors painfully. Uh, so before that, it's always good to establish some credibility uh, before you give a talk. I, uh, I'm an analyst with 451 Research, so we're, uh, we're about a 300 or so person analyst company. You can kind of see our stats there. We do all sorts of things. We cover vendors behind the, uh, the paywall that we have with reports, go over practices, what people are doing, talk with the investment community, and end users as well, just advising them as an analyst will do about what they should be doing with their IT, whether they want to sell it, buy it, or invest in it. Uh, and I started working there in September, and uh, I've, as my quick little bio, that's me up there. Uh, as, as it goes over, you know, I, I actually have been an analyst several times. I used to work at another firm called Red Monk, and in between Red Monk and 451, I worked at a little firm uh, in Round Rock called Dell. Not so little, I guess. And uh, I, I worked there in corporate strategy, starting up the software group and doing M&A, specifically on software and cloud, which gave me an interesting viewpoint, sort of in the trenches about what's going on there. And at 451, I uh, head up the infrastructure software practice, where we study I guess you could call it on-premise software that's infrastructure-based, as the name would imply. So systems management, cloud software, application development, things like DevOps, if you will. And back when I did real work, I did a lot of software development at fun places like BMC and an online banking company and lots of absurdly failed startups. So getting into the meat of it, now that I've established my credibility, uh, Here's a report that we did, the, the first rev of the DevOps study. So like I was saying, you know, the first thing in September when I came into, uh, into 451, I wanted to get a handle on what was happening in the DevOps world, because it's something I didn't really find, again, for a, mainstream, um, for a mainstream vantage point too much of in the analyst community. And there's plenty of blogs and talks about it, but I wanted to do a, a nice study of it. So we got some, uh, some people who are interested uh, in finding out more about what the early mainstream DevOps market is. And we did a study of 200 people, if you will. We, we filtered down from 500 to 200 and asked them a series of questions, uh, essentially getting at what's happening, what's, what's the baseline there and the buying behavior that you have. What, what does it look like if you're not one of these uber unicorn DevOps people, if you will? And so the first thing, you know, other than showing you a, a fancy screenshot of a PDF here, uh, you know, what I wanted to point out is, you know, whenever you do a survey, you make some compromises and you can't have too much nuance, otherwise you'll never sort of launch. So if you can read that fine print up there, and by fine I mean small, not fantastic, uh, you know, you'll see that we've kind of like settled on what might be a slightly controversial definition of DevOps, and that is, I pretty much reduced it down to you're interested in releasing software into production as frequently as possible, right? And so, you know, this goes back to the original uh, pre-DevOps velocity uh, thing with, you know, um, I think it was uh, Spock and Scotty who were presenting, and they were going over how Flickr releases 10 times a day and how they enable that, essentially. And so again, it's sort of like, how do you achieve that goal? And, you know, a lot of, and, and the way technically it seems like people achieve it is they use cloud technologies and lots of practices from the cloud world. Not only cloud as a platform, but lots of the new interesting tools that are being used in those contexts. So we filtered down those 500 people to about 200 people who seemed to be sort of um, in the mainstream. So there was no one from the technology world. They were all from many other industries, if you will. Uh, and who either kind of self-identified as doing DevOps, you know, they knew how to correctly camel case it, or they were, they sounded like someone who like was DevOps minded, like they were, they were deploying to cloud first. They were doing applications on a rapid cycle. So we, we very much so selected people who seemed to fit this idea of, of what DevOps was. So before I get into the, uh, the sort of details with a, uh, a distracting tour through macro things of why you should care about all this, I always like to start presentations with the conclusions, if you will, or the next steps, 
so you can be actionable. Uh, and I'll go over these again at the end so you don't need to memorize them or take a picture of them. I guess you can. You can take another picture. I think I changed the title on the last slide. But just to summarize, so you can leave or if you need to use the restroom or you want to polish off some more fruit juice or whatever you got going on, uh, I'll go over what, what you know, I think the takeaway should be. And keep these in mind as I'm talking. And you know, during the Q&A, you can tell me that uh, I was full of crap when, when I had these conclusions if I don't sort of prove them out. So the first one is, if you want to do DevOps, right, and you want to move as an organization into releasing your, your code into production more frequently, you want to be a DevOps person, if you will. There's sort of three buckets of things to think about. And I'll go over these in more detail at the end, so I'll be very, very quick here. But first, as with any IT thing, it's good to focus on planning. That is, you want to think about, I've got all these hundreds of applications, because I'm not like a one application person like a Netflix or a Facebook or all these other people who actually have a very small amount of applications to support versus like a bank. Uh, so segment out what the workloads are and pick ones that you'll be successful with early on to move, right? Like don't just move everything. And definitely, you know, you don't want to move your SharePoint cluster into a DevOps situation. Like I don't think that makes sense. And you know, the, the last point is, is, is a key one for, I find a lot of cloud things, but cloud um, DevOps oriented things in particular is find a greenfield application, something new. Don't find a brownfield application, something old, because it'll be a lot easier to build from the ground up, if you will. And then, of course, once you've kind of gotten done your baby steps, it's nice to move into more advanced things and so forth and so on. And so when you are going from, I don't know, crawling to walking, your, your baby steps, how do you bootstrap yourself? And in a business context, I think this first point is key. And that's part of why, as we get into the donut pie charts, we're doing this baselining is benchmark yourself, right? Like you want to know how good you are currently so that when you go through all this hassle and change, you can figure out if you've improved or declined. And if you don't like know how to currently rate yourself, then you should focus on that because you could be wasting all sorts of time on new shiny things. And as, as is often the case, especially in this community, right? Like I, I think you'll see the timing is that it's actually not, you're not like late to doing DevOps, but now is a good time to start doing POCs and labs and screwing around with it to, to learn about it, to bootstrap yourself into it. And then as we'll get into, you know, I focus a lot on the, the DevOps tool chain. Um, and, um, you know, there was a great presentation earlier today um, from Lee Thompson about the DevOps tool chain, if you want to kind of dig into what, what, what the specifics there. But I spend a lot of time talking about technology, but the, the DevOps community as a whole is very obsessed with culture and process and like all these things, like people. And I talk a little bit about that, but because there's so much saturation of that, I didn't go over it. But in fact, it warrants a third column here, you know, as, as I like to call it, hell is other people, right? So unless you're a solo person, you're going to have to uh, deal with other people and how to work with them. And the study that we did kind of pans out that like, as with all technology changes, much of your time is going to be spent on process and people and things like that. So, you know, the juice bar is out there if you're thirsty. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you some little commentary. I always enjoy when, when some sort of professional expert tries to, you know, open the kimono, as it were, or the, the shirt and sort of give you some secrets of their trade. So the first thing is, as an analyst, you're always trying to come up with some sort of cheesy framing, something that you're known for, some word. Like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you like a, a really embarrassing story from, from, from me of trying to do that unintentionally. Back in like 2007, you know, there's the, the big four of systems management. And there were these four startups who were trying to um, disrupt systems management. And I, I came up, as, as someone down here knows, the little four. Now, what was terrible about it is uh, one of them was really not applicable. So I just proved myself kind of an idiot. But, you know, it was a cool name. Little four, and some some people like remember uh, that, and it was a good framing for like here's Zenos Groundwork Hyperic and OpenQRM. I'll let you figure out which one the one was a bozo one to put in there, and uh, you know it was nice because now you had a good opposition between the two of them, and you know there's other things like, you know service-oriented application, citizen developer. We've got a great phrase of our own, best execution venue. That's all about where you place your workloads, kind of a re rethinking and rephrasing of capacity management and planning for a cloud world. So allow me to come up with some cheesy things. So when I look out over the next 10 years, I think probably what's going to happen is there's a lot of software rewriting ahead of us, right? We've got mobile apps. We've got this cloud stuff. Like, and I don't know about you, but like I said, I worked at that little Round Rock company. And man, enterprise software is awful, right? Like people need to come in and rewrite the HR apps, like all that stuff. There's so much. Like, you know, a, a good example that all of you guys will understand is like, uh, not to get ahead of ourselves, we've got to rewrite the software in this too. But like, we don't even have version control in Office. Like, that's how far behind we are, right? Like, that, the idea that like, you should be using a file name as a white collar worker to encode your, uh, what version you're working on is like pervasive in the enterprise software stack, right? So, not only are there new form factors, 
uh, like mobile and delivering on cloud, but just the software just desperately needs to be updated. You know, there's lots of flex apps out there still from the last time we tried to do this, and those are going to need to migrate as well. So, so we've got this pull, right? We're going to be rewriting a lot of software. Things are going to be great because it's going to be new software. And anytime you rewrite new software, as Y2K people know, and going from like, you know, mini computer to client server and internet, like that requires a lot of new tools and practices and methodologies and all sorts of exciting stuff's going to happen. So the big disruptor there, and that happens nowadays, and here we are to, you know, the OpenStack Summit is sort of cloud, right? So in thinking about, uh, strategically thinking about what we're going to be doing during this great rewrite. You know, the, the question becomes, so if I'm in the IT industry, I'm a vendor, I consume IT, or I just sort of like, whatever it is I do, I kind of flit around the edges and take pot shots and comment on stuff. Like I've got to kind of know the raw material I'm going to be dealing with in this new environment. So I'm not really an application person. I don't care about applications so much. I like, I used to like writing applications, but so, you know, applications, that's a thing, but never mind that. Let's, t let's take that as software as a service, right? Let's just assume that all the applications that you use or the majority of them are going to move to being delivered through a URL. So then you start to think, all right, so if there's not really any on-premise package software, what's the whole ecosystem of stuff that that like drags away from it, right? System integrators doing hardware, networking, like you don't really have all that stuff to mess with. So, you know, the way that I think of this question is like, if you take IT as you know it and you subtract out SaaS, what does that leave over? And, and that means that if you're not going to be a SaaS vendor, someone who cares about SaaS, whatever that what is, is what you've got is your raw materials to deal with. So you can imagine for me, this is kind of an important, interesting question, as, as my friend uh, Israel retweeted here. Um, and I, I think, I think uh, one, one, one person, uh, I, think, I think it might have been John Willis there, he said, you know, IT minus IT equals IT or something like that. As if, you know, that's fair. Computers, right? But uh, anyways... I always like to break the rule and put a lot of text on slides. So here's a bunch of text on a slide you're not supposed to do, so I've, I've unlocked that achievement yet again. I'm going to get sort of like the third round of it in my uh, presentation square app. But thinking through the, the whole thing of IT minus SAS equals what, in one of the reports I wrote about seemingly unrelated Atlassian down here, uh, you know, this paragraph kind of nets it out, and that is, so if you subtract out SaaS, it sort of leaves like a couple of workloads, if you will, a couple of things that IT does. Well, you got to keep the network up, which is thrilling, right? So I'm not really interested in that. You got to manage desktops, equally thrilling, right? You know, make, make, whether, even if it's BYOD or whatever, you're managing your, your white collar workers and your, your workers in general accessing your computational resources. You know, we haven't gotten to the point yet where, like, you're expected to buy your own car to drive for work, to work metaphorically. Like, you're not quite expected to provide all your own IT, which is another discussion that's confusing. And then there's things like, we could bucket it as, as analysis and data. You've got, like, HPC, business intelligence, big data, right? So all of that is kind of like customized stuff that you might buy. You might run it in the cloud or on-premise or off-premise, but it's sort of like special sauce that you're putting into. And then it seems like the bulk of what's left over in the IT minus SAS equals what equation is basically custom software development, writing your own applications, right? So if you're not, you know, babysitting, uh, what's the, the cat, you know, the, the, the pet of your ERP install and your sort of collaboration package software, like all of that stuff consumes a lot of time, like you're like, oh, I just go to a URL now. I don't need to do all that. And then so you've got all this excess time. And as a company, you could, I guess, fire all those people if you were like in a bad mood that day. Or you might start thinking about, here's the way I can use those IT resources to do something different, which I think is largely, I hope, is largely going to be driven by doing custom software development. So that's sort of the theory. And then, you know, looking at sort of the forward macro trends, if you will. I like to say macro trends. It makes me sound really smart and fancy. Uh, you know, if you look in, across lots of verticals, I don't, as I disclaimed down here, I don't have the white collar tool chain, as I like call it, uh, spoken to, but you look in all the industries and there's sort of like this ongoing injection of IT and custom written software to make things better, right? So, you know, the canonical case is, you, you, you know, it used to be, you know, you're yelling at each other, trading your orange juice commodities and everything here on, on the, uh, the stock exchange or commodity exchange or wherever you might be exchanging. But nowadays you can like rent out the floor to have some ballerinas or like Captain America come. It's like a total marketing thing, right? Like, like business doesn't actually happen there because of computers, right? Like all these computers and software developers just automated the crap out of it. And you know, now they're doing like flash trading and probably ripping us all off. But you know, there's just computers, it's like progress. 
And, uh, you know, in the retail space, we used to have these things called knuckle draggers. Like, every now and then you get in a taxi cab and the guy's, like, system's not working and he's got to use a pin to, like, do this carbon copy thing still. But for the most part, you have things like Square and, like, highly automated, uh, automated's the wrong word, but highly computerized ways of doing retail, which is even better than the POS, POS systems that were out there. And, you know, when something like this comes out and starts to dominate, like, down in Austin, it's even gotten to the point where there's sort of, like, uh, peak square, if you like. Like, I'll go into shops often and they'll have like that square sticker on the door, but they're not using square anymore. So they've already been through using it and been onto something better, which is kind of interesting. But the point is, a bunch of developers, right, like came together, like they wrote some software, right, that does all this. Like, it's all like software developers writing code instead of worrying about managing other stuff. And, and all, you see this pervasive through retail, right? Like, you hear all the stories about, like, Target knows when you're pregnant or, we, like, when you ate a bad oyster the night before. And, like, you know, that's, again, that's, that's basically developers, you know, data scientists or whatever you want to call them, programming and doing custom software development. And then in the medical area, right? Like, I mean, I don't know, but I used to have to buy my own health insurance, so I have, like, really mixed feelings about the... Uh, the healthcare system, but you know, you got like all this paperwork, like it's crazy, it's absurd, like, and they ask you for your five number, your phone number five times, and you know, you would like there to be some computers involved where like, I don't know, you could give them a USB stick to give you a copy of your records, like simple stuff, like version control in Word, like it's not rocket science. And also because, at least in the US, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but there's mandates to have more data-driven ways of billing and paying for things. So essentially there's, again, this injection of the need for a lot of IT and custom development in the healthcare area. So you can have like, instead of this sort of like person quarantining you and like wearing gloves, look at that nice handsome doctor with an iPad. He's like, you know, using computers to make your experience so, ha she looks so happy, right? Whoever's in this room, probably not happy. Not happy at all, but down here, because computers, they're great. And then in the consumer space, it's hard to come up with an example of consumer things because it's so pervasive, but Again, it's worth thinking about how, what is the frequent, there are more companies that are not technology companies doing custom software development. And you see that, of course, it occurs to me that I used Google as an example here, but this, this is a guy that I do a podcast with, and he's, uh, he gets written up all the time as like the most quantified man in the world, right? So he's got all these sensors that he wears, and he tracks everything. And kind of the end result is in the consumer space, he used to be, you know, well-fed, right? Like... <laughs> A good looking guy there. And he started tracking himself and got some hair gel. And like he wears, he wears like Google glasses and look, look how handsome he is now, right? And again, it's like computers, like all of these sensors and things. It's not only the hardware, but some developers got together and they're like, how can we get Chris Dancy to look that good, right? Let's write some code. And like, he's got all these devices with code scurrying around. So, you know, and then there's like, you know, Nike fuel bands and on and on. So think about all the industries that are out there. If they just had a team of developers that could like write some software that would like make our lives better, right? And again, I, you see that across verticals that there's the potential for that. So one of the big macro things, and then I'll finally get out of this macro rut, if you will, is, you know, cloud is clearly both public and private and all the permutations. It's, it's, it's increasingly in this environment where you want to have, as a business, people writing software that kind of mediates your relationship more with your customer through software rather than people, because who wants to deal with people? You know, it's much better to deal with an app than a person. Uh, like, you're probably going to use a cloud as a way to deliver it, right? So cloud is kind of like the environment that all of this is existing in, right? It's not like, I'm not going to show you some market sizing for the Unix market. Like, that's not going to, like, make my friend Chris healthier, right? Like, thank God Unix saved me, right? It's all going to be delivered on top of cloud things. So what's important is, and obviously you guys are involved in that and operating in that, this is another analyst thing, like, it's one thing to be excited about a technology and shiny object stuff, like from my developer days, but basically unless there's like high growth and a lot of money, the rest of the world doesn't care, right? Like, they've got no interest in it. So what you want to know is like what you see in this chart. In the cloud world with a cloud environment, how much money is there? And is that money fast growing, right? And you know, you can, you can read these figures. I've got two charts to show you as far as market sizing. Um, and the one of them is the public cloud forecast that we do at 451. And the next one will be the, let's call it the private cloud software, cloud enabling technologies. Not running cloud, but spend about software to do cloud, whether it's private or public. And so why am I showing this to like, you know, a tech conference where people care about Python and not pesos and all of that, right? Like, I don't know who cares about pesos, dollars. Um, you know, because if you're going to go back, right, and you're like, hey, I want to use software to make my life better. Like, I've heard all these people, like, are doing the software stuff. The first thing that you're going to have to prove is that there's a lot of money in it, right? Like, whether you're an end user, whether you're a vendor, someone who wants to 
uh, you know, use cloud technologies. You want to prove, A, it's not going away, it's a serious thing, and it's a major part of the industry. And so these numbers, like, give you that coverage if you need. You know, you throw this, up on, this stuff up on the wall and like, hey, look, it's real. It's not fantasy. So to that end, you know, the way we do our market sizing is basically it's a bottoms-up approach. We call around and under NDA and, you know, we anonymize the data. We, we get revenue or we estimate revenues of companies that we think are in public cloud and we throw that up there. So, you know, your forecast will vary from analyst house to analyst house. But all you really need to know is, look, it's going up. So we'll go to the next slide. And that's in billions, right? So there's billions and billions of dollars there. So the, this one is like what I find especially interesting because if we, go, if we go to the previous one, right? Like this is all public cloud. So we're tracking infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure SaaS. We don't track SaaS like Salesforce or other things like that. It's all infrastructure stuff. And this is sort of things like ServiceNow and other SaaS um, infrastructure applications that are used to support infrastructure. And so I find this a lot more interesting than an aggregate cloud thing, because an aggregate cloud thing has SaaS in it. But this is all the stuff you guys work on, right? Like infrastructure, not like applications. Uh, and again, even more so, when you look at our cloud enabling technologies um, sizing, and these, these is actually very fresh from uh, April. So not very many people have uh, seen these numbers, so you guys are lucky. Uh, essentially, what we have is automation and management, which also includes platforms to some extent, like the raw cloud platforms, and then virtualization, which includes, we're, we're cleaning up our methodology here, but, but trust me, I know the companies we track in here, and it's pretty good at representing um, private cloud software that you might buy to do private cloud things, whether it's the actual cloud platform itself, something like Chef or Puppet, or an orchestration piece of software, just up and down all the stuff that you would use for cloud. And again, really all you need to know is it's going up and it's in billions, right? So there's a whole lot of activity starting back in 2012 and like, you know, t around 25 billion is, is not much, you know, not, not too much to, uh, to like sniff at, that's, that's a good rate. So the point is that in this environment, right, like if you wanna start deploying things on cloud, that's clearly the direction things are going and where there's lots of spend. And the other important thing is, I don't have the number up here, but is the growth, right? The rate at which this is growing. Like normal IT growth every year is, it kind of tracks GDP to some extent. And it's like, I don't know, two to 3%. It's pretty boring, right? It doesn't go up that much, but these growths are always double digits, right? So there's lots of activity and people doing things here. So finally, to bore you with some more bar charts, you know, the juice is down there as a reminder if you got bored and I already told you the conclusion so if you're bored to, to death now's your escape hatch time there's, there's another survey that we do from, from ChangeWave. The previous stuff was from our InfoPro surveying. And we ask people in a corporate context, what is your plan for public and private cloud usage? You know, you can see we've been doing it for many, many quarters. Uh, and here we include SaaS, so it's a bit like overblown on that. But you can see a steady rise and, and a slight flattening, if you will, of people who are planning on using public and private cloud, which is great. I mean, this is a huge part of the market, right? So all of your peers are jumping off of the bridge, right? Like it, lots of people are doing it. It's, it's clouds a real thing, if you will. Now, what I find especially p interesting is like the private cloud tracking that we do, right? Because um, I actually make a joke about this and I've encountered this a few times since, but like I don't think private SaaS is real. So I assume this doesn't include SaaS. I think by definition, there is no private SaaS. So that means this is pure infrastructure, right? In the private cloud area. And again, like there's a huge amount of people who are looking at private infrastructure cloud infrastructure um, in, in, in companies out and, and using it. And I believe this is all North American uh, as well because, you know, that's what you do. Uh, anyways, you know, and, and this also uh, matches with lots of the other surveys that we do that increasingly there's more and more demand for cloud. So in that environment, right, so, you know, what, what are people doing with cloud? What workloads are they putting there? And this is something that, that you know, all my, uh, my friends and, and Twitter followers and people know I obsess over is like, I'm not really interested in the raw cloud. Like, what application are you running on top of it? What are you doing with it? And so it was ni it's nice to have this sort of data at our disposal. So here's another chart that we have that goes over um, what are you doing private cloud, on-premise, managed, and public and hybrid cloud with, in broad buckets of workloads. And you can see that pri public cloud usage is still relatively small compared to the other numbers that you might add up. But it's interesting to see that people are doing lots of batch computing, collaborative applications, you know, they're, they're sort of business to business applications things here. And, and the, these are kind of the two confirming like anecdotes you always hear here that like our core applications, we would never move that to the cloud or like some cloud thing. So they, they're very much so want these things be, to be uh, hybrid, if not private, if you will. They kind of, 
these core apps take up a lot of the, um, the cloud usage. And then there's sort of a, a minority bar down here of test dev, which, which happens quite frequently. But again, it's interesting to know like, what people are actually using cloud for, because that discussion, I feel, doesn't come up very much. And then just very briefly, you know, I mentioned mobile as like, something that affects usage of DevOps and, and demand for cloud quite a bit. So as, as one more thing to hopefully arm you with the ability to go back and like work on fun stuff instead of whatever boring stuff you were beset with before this, uh, you know, you can be like, we really need a mobile app, right? And so uh, we, we also have the Yankee group here in 451. And one of the, the questions they had in a recent survey was like, so uh, was it useful to do a mobile app? Was it valuable to your business after you did it? And sure enough, it was, right? So if you add up the, the basically, you know, rate on, on a scale of 10, 1 to 10, where 10 is the highest, the value of having done a mobile app. And if you add up, you see here the 7 and the 6 and the 10, 9 and 8, the high and the medium to high, like everyone was like, yeah, it was really valuable. It's a good idea to do a mobile app. So, you know, that's a nice area to go explore. Like it's clear that there is return on doing mobile applications. And then to dig down into that a little bit, it's interesting to ask in the same survey, um, I mean, it's a relatively small sample set, so, you know, we got that going for us. But uh, essentially, you know, what, what are your customers finding valuable that you do with the mobile app, right? Is it just like customer service support, actually transacting things? And you can see these slides on slide shares. You can dissect these bar graphs as, as much as you like. But again, this gives you an interesting roadmap that if you want to start doing a mobile app, here are things that the other companies say their customers are finding valuable, right? Starting off with just like getting information from the company, like giving them, you know, letting them talk with you, so forth and so on. So it's, it's always interesting to know what your peers are doing so you can plan out the, the work on your own. Because, you know, ultimately, if we go all the way back to the top, right, like the idea is we're going to have some teams of developers working on code that are going to start making business more interesting and driving more, not only retention, but growth in their business use. They're, they don't have to focus on the package software on-premise stuff anymore, and they've got all this free time to write custom apps, essentially. So, you know, obviously you're going to need DevOps for that, right? Like that's sort of the assumption that I have is you want to build these custom apps, run them on a cloud. And we used to call it agile and all sorts of stuff like that, but you're probably not going to use CMM, right? Or some Prince or Corbit or some other word that's in all caps. Uh, Cobit, not Corbit, but we should come up with that one. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of gets to the point of like, so if there's all this potential, what does the mainstream DevOps market look like? Like we, again, we know that all the typical examples are awesome and they're doing great stuff, but out in the normal world, right? Like out in the, you know, the, the fat part of the country, the middle part, not physically, just large. Uh, like what are people doing? And so this is the, some of the questions from the study that we had just to get a baseline and a sense of how things are going. So the first question we ask is when you deploy your application, right? Like where do you, where do you end up deploying it? And it's somewhat counterintuitive to what you would expect, but you know, when you're in the trenches of, of these surveys, it matches up with exactly with what you continually see is that people don't really do a lot of public cloud as much pure public cloud, if you will. Instead, they do a bunch of hybrid cloud and private cloud, uh, essentially, if you add all this up when they deploy their applications, which is interesting, right? So that means that at least amongst your peer group, if you consider yourself normal instead of uh, extraordinary, if you will, or unicorny, that you're probably going to be doing some private cloud deploys, if you will. And if you're a vendor, it means that you definitely want to service the private cloud market and not just the public cloud market exclusively. And it's also an interesting commentary on how far we are in sort of like cloud taking over, right? There's still lots of private cloud amongst this mainstream DevOps world. So the next question we asked, uh, again, the premise of, of DevOps here was that you are deploying to production frequently, right? So the, the baseline question is, so how frequently are you deploying to production? This is one of the nicer findings is that, as you can see, adding this up, like there is actually a lot of people who at least can deploy every 30 days. Now, we didn't ask them, are you deploying a bug fix or like something wrong? We just ask how often you update production. We'll get some more refinement on that when we do it again. But like, I would say this is extremely encouraging, right? Like there's people delivering every 30 days. Now we had this kind of not nicely phrased category on demand, which we should just eliminate because I don't know if that means every like five minutes or every 18 months. So, you know, I would kind of dismiss this, but the one way I would sort this away is like if 31, per, if a third of the people think they can do on demand, that probably means they like doing on demand. So there's high aspirations to, to be able to deliver that, that way. So there's this pull, this, this demand, so to speak, to deliver more frequently. There's a need for what DevOps delivers, right? It's not just sort of an obligatory thing, if you will. So the next thing that we wanted to test out is what tools are in usage. What, um, 
what technologies are people using and how far along are they? So again, we have these broad buckets of tools, right? And most of it's like not that interesting, if you will, right? Like it's, it's, it's more or less penetrated with people thinking about it, right? It's not a done market, but you can see plenty of people have testing, lots of performance management, release management's doing pretty well, like all these things you would need with DevOps. And what's interesting and sort of confirming is this is sort of like the orchestration end-to-end -end service management category. And it sort of confirms like when you go off into the DevOps or Roddy land, like everyone's like, oh, we need orchestration. That's what we're lacking. We're going to work on that next. And indeed, that's sort of what's missing that people aren't using very much. And if you peel back the covers here, what's also interesting about this is you ask the actual tools that people are using. So they may be satisfying the needs here, but you ask about the tools, as we'll see, and they're actually using, uh, let's call them pre-DevOps tools, right? So you see a lot of incumbent tools out there, not necessarily the utopic DevOps tool chain that you would expect. And to that end, one of the ideas of doing DevOps is that, as, as this kind of oddly worded thing says, um, you achieve these efficiencies where you can deploy to production more frequently by using the same tools in each stage in development, QA, staging, and production. You try to use as many of the same tools as possible so you don't have this throwing over the wall and reformulating, right? So in the utopic DevOps world, you're essentially in development modeling how things are gonna look in production and using the same tools. So again, it's a bit hyperbolic and utopic, but we wanted to see, are people actually doing that? And it turns out, they're sort of not, right? Like, so I, I consolidated this down to automation tools, but it used to say automation tools like Puppet, Chef, Salt, Ansible, et cetera, right? So how, how much in this early DevOps, mainstream DevOps market, are you, using, are you doing this core practice of DevOps, of modeling your stuff in development with the same tools you use to do in production? And, and not, not that many of them are using these ideal tools. Now, they are doing like custom build scripts and golden images and all this stuff. And like, you know, this is always troubling. Like, you know, no one likes build people, right? The build team's always like annoying and, and, and like, they're not great. Like they don't believe in the moon landing and all sorts of things like that. <laughs> And like, so like, and the way that they maintain their control is with this, this custom written build stuff. And it's just infuriating, right? And so like, you gotta get rid of that. That's just not responsible. And, and you know, I, I think it'll be interesting, like Golden Image was were like sort of reviled by this little crew up here for a long time. And then all of a sudden Docker comes along and I realize it's not virtualization. I'm not supposed to say that, but it's sort of like the same thing. So we'll see how that pans out. Uh, so, uh, you know, what's in an interesting takeaway from here is that there's a lot of immaturity. Either the assumption is wrong about this being a core practice of DevOps, or there's a lot of immaturity in the mainstream DevOps um, market about using this, which means it's early in the market and there's lots of room for improvement, which is a positive way of looking at essentially saying like DevOps isn't that per pervasive in this one practice way in, uh, in the mainstream market. Um, so also in the technology area, you know, another thing that, you know, you always hear in, in a DevOps context is you should be doing continuous builds and continuous integration and continuous X, if you will. So we wanted to know, like, what CI tools are you using, if any? And things are slightly better here, right? Like, so this is like CI products like Jenkins and Hudson and Bamboo and so forth and so on, right? And, but what is kind of shocking is not only like, you know, there's a bit of a pass for doing your own continuous integration. I mean, again, it's really like, why are you spending your time doing that when you could not and just get an off the shelf or off the web thing to do it? So there's a large chunk that isn't using a standard way of doing CI. But then there's these guys, like, what are they doing? Right? Like, like, let's account for margin of error and say like 30 to 35% of the people have no continuous anything. Like, they're just doing continuous fail, essentially, up here. <laughs> like, so, like, that's kind of shocking. And again, it gets to the immaturity of the mainstream DevOps market and all the potential to, like, start doing something, right? So, it's, it's almost as if, like, the, it's not even the, the glass is half full. The glass is, like, almost empty when it, when it comes to the full potential of this. So then, um, wrapping up here. Uh, as I said, hell is other people, right? Like this is my new core thesis and outlook on, on life in general. Um, and, uh, but you guys are lovely. I enjoy talking with you. Uh, so we also ask in this survey, like what's holding you back from like filling that glass, if you will, right? Like, you know, the, you, like why, why are you not achieving your potential? you sad sacks of people. And uh, you know, these are canned responses we had, so we kind of limited them. But it's interesting to file these, to categorize them and file them away in your, your head, right? So 
Um, most of them, I would say the majority of them, I forget what the number is, I think I put it in my notes here to be handily referred to, but around 70% of it is basically people-based problems, right? So most of the things that are holding people back are caused by people. And in fact, when, you, when we look at our other surveys that ask about why are you not advancing in cloud more frequent, like faster, it's also non-IT issues, right? It's resistance to change, budgeting, like people don't want to do new stuff, it's people, right? So. Here, you know, you've got the old, this is like what DevOps is supposed to solve, right? The old wall of confusion. An inefficient process of handing off between development and test and security and all these guys. So that's still like a huge problem out there. And again, in this very selective selection of people who are supposed to be DevOps folks, if you will, in the mainstream. So it's still a problem for them. And then there's like, you know, my people suck like the human resource constraints, which I, that's probably always persists. Like you always want people to be smarter. But it is interesting that like skills are a real problem in this area, right? Finding people who know how to deal with the technologies and, and just like uh, do, you know, act the way that you want essentially. And then there's always like, you know, this is also sort of like technical debt or infrastructure debt. Like it's, it's a good like, you know, the gods of IT sort of like do that free will trick on you where they're like, well, you can commit infrastructure debt Good luck with that, right? Like, I'm not going to prevent you from doing it. And definitely, like, there's all this complexity that you inherit by making shortcuts and changes and things. So that's definitely something holding people back. And then, of course, there's the freaking product managers, right, who are always, like, giving you new requirements midstream, right? And another thing that Agile and, and DevOps is supposed to address. But again, the summary is that when... Um, when my sort of like fellow DevOps fans come up to me and like, Kote, you gotta stop talking about tools. It's all about people, it's culture. Um, essentially they're right, right? Like much of what you need to address are people and culture and process and change. And then you can bring in the tools, if you will. So to review our next steps, as I said. So, you know, essentially, what you want to do in this in environment, like when you, you know, as we were saying, you've got infrastructure complexity and things that may not work out. So if you want to do DevOps and you know use computers to make the world a better place or make more money, you can choose which way. Uh, essentially, you want to segment out what you have. Like look at all the stuff you have, the projects, the existing things, and segment it out and be like, this cluster of things, it's kind of a new application. It's not an old application. I could start applying cloud and DevOps to that. I'll be relatively secure with it. It's it's something that's that's doable and, and I'm not gonna get it's not a quack I'm going to get stuck in. And then business-wise, it's very important to think about don't just sort of like spend your efforts on DevOps and new things on stuff that's not really differentiating to your business. And by differentiating, I mean something that allows you to get more money from your customers or prevent them from leaving. Something that makes you different than other options that they have. We go to all like Michael Porter on what differentiation means, but who has the time for that? Uh, so you want to pick something that's strategically valuable that's going to help your business. And then also, you know, based on the study and you know the stuff we were going over, like the as as the middle bullet point said, you know, the point of this, as the middle bullet point says, is that the usage of DevOps and also cloud is very early, right? Like it's it's not a done game, and you shouldn't really too feel too bad if you're not doing it yet, right? But it really is a good time to start POCing and trying things out. And if you're not doing that, then you probably are a little too late. Like you don't want to be sitting here like two years from now and like, hmm, cloud, I haven't tried that out yet, right? Like you want to experiment with some things and get some some experience. Um, below, you know, below your belt, under your belt. Uh, so, and to that end, like as as with any engineering-led thing, it's nice to start with small things that you'll be successful at, rather than picking a big thing that you're going to fail at. Like that's not cool. So you definitely want to try something that's uh, like small instead of doing big problems and build up to larger problems, if you will. And like I said earlier, you need to know how good or bad you are so that when you start applying these things, you can figure out if you've improved or not. Because it would be kind of absurd with that, a year after doing DevOps, like if you didn't know if it was better or worse than when you didn't do DevOps. And then finally, you know, as I was saying, my evolving outlook on life, hell is other people. Like it's clear that like the... Um, you know, DevOps, in my mind, is sort of a continuation of, of, of Agile and agility and getting the operations people more involved in this idea of everyone coming together and, and working better together. That's a lot of what Agile addresses. And as you expand DevOps and cloud and agility and the rest of the company, the thing to keep in mind is the reason you're doing it is one, to reduce costs and also to, to increase speed, increase the release speed that you're having. And if you do just one of those, 
Like if all you do is reduce costs and you're just virtualization, right? Which is great, but it kind of like runs its course and then you're like, now everything's virtualized, now what do I do? But if you can target both of those, if you can both increase release speed, which means you get more features out to your customers and target more growth, and it's cheaper, like that's a great combination of, of something to do. So when you're dealing with other people who are resistant to these things, tell them that like those are the points. Like tell them that you know it's worth their time to consider this because it's gonna be both cheaper and also better for the business. And to that end, one of the main things that, that I, I try to plot on about is I don't think the, 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 the business, I'm sure that's a phrase you guys all use, like really expects much from us. Like they probably think IT is a waste of time and they're frustrating. And like they're just the one that pop up windows and make it so that I can't like watch YouTube at work. Like <laughs> IT is not a source of happiness for the business, right? And so as you get better and you can do great things with IT, you need to go back and engage with the business and be like, hey, you should ask more from me. Right? Like, I can do something, right? Like, don't just outsource it or fire me and then do some shadow IT stuff. Like, I could help you. Like, I, I've improved. I don't drink as much anymore, right? <laughs> and, and, like, essentially, you have to re engage with them and train them to, like, ask for interesting things for you instead of just, like, managing your desktop, unless that's what you like. Uh, so, Finally, you know, I, I think the big takeaway of, of hell being other people is that it really is like, uh, if, if you want to be militaristic, kind of a culture war, if you will. Like, you need to like go out there and combat the, the, the you know, the, the non-moon landing believing people who want to do the old way, and and definitely like talk with the business people and change process over, and 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 get people engaged in more of a conversation about process and culture. And as a bonus. Uh, I, you know, we had DevOps Days Austin a little while ago, and Andrew Schaefer gave like a great cultural talk, if you will. There's all sorts of talks about samurais and or samurais and wooden swords and metal swords and all sorts of stuff like that. And then like you kind of look at it and it's like, well, what's going on here? But it's a good talk and overview of the cultural side of DevOps. So with that, you know, to leave you with, leave you with something that's hopefully is slightly inspiring, right? Like I think it's pretty clear, like looking through the stuff, that there's strong business demand for software development and custom coding, if you will. And there's lots of opportunity to satisfy it, but we're very early in like taking advantage of the opportunity and tools. And there's a lot of maturing that we have ahead of us, but you know, there's great opportunity out there if you want to be in IT. So good luck out there. And with that, thank you. <laughs>